All right, the six weeks are up again, and we've got Rust 1.75. As always, Rust Up Update to get the new version. You can do Rust Up Update Stable or just Rust Up Update to update all of your channels. And we've got at least one major update in 1.75, but let's start off with code layout optimizations for Rust C. So the Rust compiler has gotten faster in two different ways, at least, including a 2% improvement from using Bolt, a post link optimizer, and also building Rust C itself with code gen units equals one. These improvements are restricted to the x86-64 unknown Linux GNU target, but should expand over time. And then of course, we've got some newly stabilized APIs as always. First off, we've got the option as slice language feature. In 1.74, this was unstable and had to be enabled. And in 1.75 works just fine. So what is it? Well, you can specify any option and then convert that option to a slice using as slice. In this case, we've got a function here called ARR that takes a slice of U32s, iterates over that slice, multiplies each value by five and sums it. And we're using that with an option of U32. We turn that option into a slice, use the sum slice function, and this function will either get an empty slice, which will result in zero, or it will get a slice with one element of three, which results in 15, as we can see on the left. This API is mostly useful to make sure that you can write functions that operate on collections of items and not have to write special functions so that an option can be accepted by this function argument. So it's a nice quality of life improvement for functions that need to operate on sets of items that we also potentially want to pass a single or zero values into. The other notable thing about option to slice is if we have an option of a shared reference to a slice, instead of getting a slice to references to that inner thing, we can use map or to either set the empty slice or use standard slice from ref. Standard slice from ref, of course, does very much the same thing that we just saw with the option. And it takes a reference to a T and gives us back a slice of T's. And in this case, we're mapping over that slice to get the length of each thing and returning a VEC of U sizes. So nice quality of life feature in option slice. Next, we've got ranges of U sizes. In 1.74, if you tried to use zero dot dot in a match on a number, specifically a U size, this should match all U sizes. But in 1.74, it wasn't recognized as doing so. So we would get pattern underscore not covered. Now in 1.75, this works just fine and is recognized as exhaustively covering all of the possible values for U size. 1.75 also gets a buff read implementation for a VEC deck. In 1.74, trying to run this code would specifically indicate that dot lines can't be called on a VEC deck of U8s. In 1.75, it can, because there is now an implementation of buff read for a VEC deck of U8s. In this case, we've got our VEC deck of a bunch of U8s, which I'm constructing with byte literals here on characters. And we do four line and input dot lines, which means every time we hit this new line, we're actually getting each line here. So it's a buffered read instead of getting individual characters. This again comes from the buff read trait, which includes this lines function. And the final smaller stabilization that I wanna cover is if we look at, if we look at the modified time, because I just touched this file.txt, as well as this main.rs, we can see that 12 seconds ago and now these files were modified. If we run this script, we can see that the current system time is something, and the system time that we are going to set this new file to is something else. In this case, we're taking now and we're doing a checked subtraction with a duration of this much seconds, which is going to work for us. So I've unwrapped it, logging those two things out, which is what we're seeing here on the left, and then using the file.txt that we just looked at as the target to set the new modified time to that past date. So we use one of the newly stabilized functions for that called set times with this file time struct. And now if we look at the modified time for file.txt, we get a modified date of five years ago. So now it's much easier to mess with the modified and also accessed timestamps inside of a file. There are some platform specific notes about what works and how it works on specific platforms. So if you're going to use this, make sure you note those. And this is a fallible function, so it'll return errors if you lack permissions or if the operating system doesn't have the support to change the timestamps. And that brings us perhaps to the flagship feature of 1.75. And that itself has an entire blog post announcing async function and return position impl trait in traits. This is the acronym RPITIT, if you've seen that. But that's a lot of acronyms, so what does that actually mean? What it means is that now we can have traits where the functions return impl 
some trait. So in this case, I have a character's trait with a character's function that takes a reference to self and it returns an implementation of iterator where the items are characters. So for our first struct called many characters, we have a string inside of that struct. So the implementation of this character's trait can just do self.0.cars. For our many numbers struct here, which is a vec of u8s, it's not quite as easy, but we can do self.0.iter and then map over those to turn them into cars. In both of these cases, the iterators are slightly different, but we still get to return anything that implements iterator. So in this case, we're returning map, and in that case, we're returning cars. So if we take this and run it, we can construct one of those many characters structs with some string slice in it that we turn into a string, and we iterate over that using this new characters function and enumerate. So value.characters returns an iterator that we can keep using, and we debug out this character in each iteration, which you can see on the left here. Similarly, if we scroll down far enough, we can see that many numbers, which is a vec of u8s, also returns an iterator of characters from this characters function that was on our trait. So we can now enumerate over that, and we can still print out each of the characters. In this case, the implementation is mapping over those u8s and turning them directly into cars. So in both cases, we get an iterator where the item is car, which is really nice. But the implications don't stop there. What we have now, because of this, specifically because async functions actually return impl future, if we look at future, future is a trait. So async functions return impl future with an output type, just like we just saw with the impl iterator. That means that we can now use async functions inside of traits. And this is huge. So in this case, we have a JSON API trait, some associated error type, and an async function that returns either a Saturday JSON value or the error type that is specified in the trait. So if we construct a struct called my API that holds a client from request, we can implement JSON API for my API, define that associated error type to be request error, and then define that fetch function as being the request fetch, which is an async function call. So self.client.get with the URL we pass in, we send that, we await it, handle the error, turn it into JSON, await it, and return the result. This gives us code like we see below, where we have Tokyo main on our async main function. We construct our struct with the new bootstrapped client inside of it. So we've got our API. That API can now call fetch, which is an async function that we can now await. And finally, we get the response back out. So there's quite a few dependencies here because of Tokyo. I have everything enabled in Tokyo, for example. And in this case, we can actually see that this request is hanging because this API that I hit here is not necessarily always that stable. And if I try to visit that API in the browser, it does look like it's having some issues right now, which is unfortunate. So if maybe we pick up a different API to use and drop it in here, then we can see that we got a JSON response. And we used this async trait to make this pretty generic fetch call. So you could imagine that this could be used to have two implementations, for example, in a Leptos app, where you now just call fetch and the type system encodes that the return values are all going to match, which is somewhat nice because right now what I'm doing in my Leptos apps is just conditionally compiling one client for the server and one client for the client. So I'm super excited about this. This is a huge major feature. It is important to note that not everything that you would expect from say the async trait crate, which is what people used to use, that is this crate on the right here, not everything is available. So there are still reasons at the current time to use this async trait crate. And this is because, for example, its usage is still discouraged in public traits. Users can't put additional bounds on the return type. So if you don't specify everything in the trait, for example, in this case, reverse or rev requires the double-ended iterator trait, not just the iterator trait. And if that isn't fully specified in some way, then you do not get this. This does not work. Similarly, because of what we just talked about, async function, which is impl future, has the same issues. And if you do try to do this, you will get a warning that using async function in public traits is discouraged. And there are some more technical details around send bounds, as well as object safety. In the meantime, if this is something that you're trying to do, there is a new crate called trait variant, which will allow you to make multiple versions of this trait. So in this case, if you use the trait variant crate and you say, add that send bound that we were talking about with a new trait called int factory, then you'll get a blanket implementation for anything that implements int factory will also implement local int factory with the additional bound of send. But currently the rules are basically, if you are going to have a private trait 
feel free to do whatever you want. If you're going to have a public trait that other people use, think a little bit more carefully about it. And there are still reasons to use the async trait macro from the async trait crate. And that's it for REST 1.75, a really exciting release, especially with return position infiltrate and trait, but also another couple of stabilizations for quality of life improvements as usual. So have a great rest of your day and I will see you in six weeks for the next one.